I think here there is a large uh, research area that we need to explore in all other, in all different direction. It's very topical in South Africa at the moment. It will be the same for the next, let's hope, only 10 years uh, that we can solve this issue in, the, in this time. And therefore, there is a lot of issue, uh, issue editation that we need to look at. There is a few research, uh, research that is going on, and we can start now with Hilton. Hilton, thank you very much. Take 30, 35 minutes, and then we, we have uh, qu a question and answer session, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Nicola. Um, let me just share my. Can you all see my screen? Yeah. Okay, great. Uh, thanks, Nicola and Romain, for um, accepting the paper to this workshop. Um, and Margot for the introductions. So, this research is part of ongoing work that I'm doing um, for the National Treasury. So the usual disclaimer applies, you know, these are my views and not those necessarily of the National Treasury. Um, and the title of the paper is Government Debt and Interest Rate. I think, you know, the motivation for this, I mean, as Nicolas pointed out, um, it's, it's quite in your face at the moment in South Africa. And, you know, the, 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 the sovereign debt risk that is creeping up, um, academics have been concerned for this for some while. Um, market participants are pricing in a much higher probability of default within the next five years. This is twice as large as that of Brazil currently and more in line with Turkey at the moment. Um, and even policymakers um, have, have stressed, you know, the, the impending sovereign debt crisis that might occur um, in the next few years. Um, I just, uh, after Eric's talk yesterday, you know, uh, you, you spoke about finding the right surplus and this S-shaped impulse response of the primary balance. So the first thing I did when I got home was check my results. And indeed, uh, government consumption expenditures seems to give you the nice S-shaped response. So I, I thought I'd put that in there. But that's not the main uh, thing I'm going to be talking about. I want to take a little bit more of a closer look and and um, at the relationship between government debt and interest rates. And I mean, just today, the quarterly bulletin that's released by the South African Reserve Bank, um, you know, highlighted this, that the growth in debt service costs needs to be contained as a top priority um, for fiscal sustainability. Um, and, and this should be primarily achieved through <clears throat> debt containing measures. So this link between, you know, fiscal sustainability and interest rates is really at the forefront of uh, or at the, the, the key interaction um, um, for this issue that the, the, this kind of this pertinent issue that we are facing at the moment. And this is what I'm really going to be applying, you know, the model and the research I've been doing on this specific topic to hopefully shed some light on the interaction between debt and interest rates. And, you know, a, a lot of the literature in the past, I think we've moved away from this, but um, it really focuses on this relationship between, you know, debt, which is a stock variable, and um, the government budget balance, which is a flow variable, and that with the term spread, or the risk premium. And, you know, typically, you know, as debt is rising, that risk premium gets priced in, and, and the spread widens between, you know, government's three-month treasury bill and the long-term, typically the 10-year rate. Um, and, the, and the reverse holds for the budget balance, right? So you're running a primary balance deficits, this tends to kind of add fuel the, the risk premium. Um, and, you know, what, what I also provide the motivation in, uh, so I also in the paper that, I, that, that, I'm, that should come out soon, uh, I also provide a little bit of motivation and, and do some very basic re reduced form. And here, I'm, when I talk about reduced form, I'm not being condescending to, you know, structural VARs versus DSG. It's not about that. When I mean reduced form, I'm specifically talking about whether we consider the impact of debt on interest rates or the effect of a government stimulus that is debt financed on interest rates. And typically, so if you're just looking at debt, the stock or the budget, the flow, um, but this is a reduced form measure or a, a, a proxy for debt finance fiscal stimulus. Um, and typically the, the literature, the, the, all the literature focused on this relationship and it missed the, 
the, the nuances on the components, whether it's expenditure or tax revenue, or even the different instruments that are involved um, uh, 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 in fiscal policy decisions that can lead to debt um, being accumulated to finance that you know, expenditure increase or the tax cut um, that can raise that risk premium. So, and then this is a key transmission mechanism for fiscal multipliers and fiscal sustainability. Um, and what we actually see is that if you use this kind of reduced form measure of debt or the deficit, that the average effect that you get of it on the risk premium is very similar to the combined effect that you get when you look at the disaggregated measures. And that's something that I do. So theoretically, um, these debt finance, uh, debt finance fiscal stimulus programs will stimulate aggregate demand okay, through either expenditures or tax cuts, but the effectiveness is going to be highly de dependent on the degree of crowding out of private sector expenditure, spillover effects through the, of the risk premium to the private sector, and the interaction between fiscal policy and monetary policy. So these are the three, you know, more standard channels that, that I will be focusing on. I don't look at uh, the role of the banks uh, or, or a richer financial sector dynamics. Konstantin Makrilov and some co-authors, uh, Janse van Rensburg and Diyacher and Serena Marino and others have recently um, been taking a closer look at this. Uh, so I'm focusing on these three channels. And I want to ask three questions. What is the effect of disaggregated debt finance revenue and expenditure shocks on interest rates, right? And how important are these transmission mechanisms, the three that I just mentioned, the degree of crowding in and out, the risk premium, and the interaction of fiscal and monetary policy. And then I want to also look at the flip side, right? Because there's reverse causality. You don't necessarily have debt leading only to interest rates. You have the interest rate shocks that can affect debt. So. I want to look at the relative importance of monetary policy, domestic and foreign, as well as the risk shocks to the risk premium. And I try to identify the effect of credit rating specifically there. Um, so with regards to the contribution, um, Nicola, I mean, just spoke about it, that this is kind of receiving obviously a lot more attention in the literature. So the empirical evidence that exists on, in South Africa on the, on, on the effect of government debt on interest rates is quite limited. Pedica is a recent study. Again, some of the papers that have come out this year have also been looking at this. Uh, Pedica looks at uh, the South African US spread and, and you know, he, he estimates that of the recent rise of 700 basis points of the spread between US and, and South African long-term uh, uh, interest rates, on government debt, about half of that, or nearly half of that, is is attributable to um, the, the South Africa's debt accumulation, and much of the other li the literature is focused on the role of debt on growth or interest rates on the macroeconomy, and uh, um, some of the other SAR papers have been looking at the, the effects of credit ratings. So it's really the the main contribution is the uh, those first two questions, that third question where I'm looking at the effect of you know interest rate shocks on debt. That's that's been done a little bit more. And of course, you know, fiscal policy is, is darn hard, as Eric put it yesterday. So um, this has been a very uh, interesting uh, new avenue of research for me, and um, hopefully we can contribute to this, uh, this development of the work from staff. So I use a New Keynesian Open Economy Fiscal DSG model. Um, I'm not gonna go into it too much, this is a model based on uh, Kemp and Hollander, which is a working paper that came out last year that was also based on Harry Kemp's the PhD thesis work. And, you know, this, these, you know, love them or hate them, DSG models are well suited for these sorts of questions, these ones that involve counterfactual analysis. Um, this is a very large model. Uh, um, it includes a non-trivial role for fiscal policy. You've got three instruments on the expenditure side, consumption, investment, and, and government transfers, but three instruments on, on, on the tax side, you know, labor income cap tax, capital tax, and consumption tax. Sticky prices, sticky wages, Ricardian, non-Ricardian households, um, you know, the, 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 the standard features in a, in a New Keynesian type model. Um, the agents are rational forward looking and, and, and optimizing and households have access to domestic and foreign bonds. 
So we estimate this model with South African data and primarily the work that I've been working on now is kind of applying this model that we're developing for the National Treasury, you know, to different research questions, essentially, that are pertinent and, and, and need, need some answers to. Um, yeah, the, 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 I suppose what's important to remember that these six fiscal policy variables are estimated by six uh, reaction functions that respond to output and debt. Um, and there's a persistence parameter there as well. Uh, I'm going to quickly just brush through the main findings of the paper, and then we can, you know, dig in. And then everyone knows what I'm talking about, and then we can dig into some of the results. Um, probably won't. Be, I won't have time to go through everything, uh, and you know, questions will then be be welcome. So, what are the what are the main main findings on the effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus on interest interest rates? Um, I already mentioned that these reduced form estimates provide quantitatively similar results to the net effect of debt finance fiscal stimulus on real yields. Now the short and the, and the long rate uh, uh, and even the spread as well. But for fiscal policy analysis, and this is where it becomes important, there are very clear non-negligible differences in the responses of the different agents in the model, households, firms, and, and the monetary authority, as well as the risk premium to each of the disaggregate fiscal policy shocks. And this is particularly clear for expenditure side, not so much on the revenue side. And I, I'm not gonna deal too much with the revenue side. And one of the reasons for this is that the way you input the revenue data in the model, it's not marginal tax rate changes, it's the realized tax, right? So it's like the effective tax rate um, that, that, that the, the government receives um, as a share of, you know, let's say if it's VAT, it'll be the, the VAT income received as a proportion of total disposable um, in, or consumption expenditure. Sorry. Um, so it, it's it, I've, I've referred to this as tax revenue shortfalls um, and some other things. I'm not going to get into it too much. I'll mention it, but if someone wants to maybe discuss this a little bit more, we can. But the main, I think the main key insight here is that, you know, which is not controversial, I think, based on international and domestic literature, that investment-driven uh, uh, government expenditures is typically um, more favorable, favorable than government consumption in terms of uh, growth. Um, but also, if this is to, the, to the extent that this is also debt finance, it also produces far more favorable fiscal sustainability outcomes. And uh, I'm not going to talk so much about fiscal sustainability per se. Uh, the next session that, uh, that Roy will present uh, will we'll kind of look into that aspect a little bit more. Um, I think this is something that's kind of added since the last time I, I presented, the end of last year. And um, I tried to look at the, these transmission mechanisms, right? These three uh, transmission mechanisms I spoke about. And um, it, 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 uh, what, what the model suggests is that, you know, the risk premium, the endogenous response of the risk premium, that is the risk premium is a function of government debt to GDP, in the model. So this endogenous response of the risk premium on the long-term rate, as well as the endogenous response of monetary policy to fiscal shocks, have very sizable um, influences on the, on, the, on the impulse responses of, the, of um, government expenditure on, on the macroeconomic variables, upward inflation and debt and so on. Um, and this is something uh, that's kind of been debated a bit in the in in uh, this year is of the role of crowding out of government consumption. Konstantin Makrilov's uh, working paper that came out, they they cite us and they say um, well, we we calibrated our model and 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 we assume substitutability. Uh, that it's not totally true. We we estimated the parameter, and. Um, we actually find that it's not a big role. But what I do, what I, what I want to point out here is I actually look at the range of estimates we get to try to see how important this crowding out or in can be. And it doesn't, it, well, it can, it appears to be important for government consumption expenditure, it's not a, not a significant channel. So the, it's quite clear that the risk premium and the endogenous response of monetary policy, as well as monetary policy shocks, uh, are, are important in the transmission mechanism. Um, and that leads to that uh, second set of, of findings that go from, you know, the interest rate effects on debt. And we see that monetary policy contributes 
approximately 13% of the variance of government debt to GDP and risk premium shocks contribute about 10% to um, debt to GDP. And finally, uh, in my attempt to try and kind of identify the credit rating shocks, I can I'll explain what I did later, um, and that this is approximately 50% larger than non-ratings related risk premium shocks. Um, and, and I think this is important because while we're in an environment of an accommodative monetary policy stance, um, that this can be offset. And the, the size of a credit rating shock and the size of the monetary policy shock are very similar. So, you know, to the extent that you have this accommodative stance, if this risk is rising from the, from the, the rising government debt to GDP, you know, that, it, that it's so much that it affects the rating outlook, that this could offset those kind of gains from that, that, that take place when, when monetary policy is accommodated. Because essentially when monetary policy is accommodated, it relaxes the constraint of government budget balance. Okay, so that's everything in a nutshell. Um, we can dig into some of the, the, the results. Predominantly going to be using, explaining things through impulse response functions. Um, and as I said, I'm not going to focus so much on the tax revenue side of things. So this graph here um, plots the response of you know, government debt, output, inflation, and the, and the interest rates to the various expenditure shocks. The green line is the government consumption expenditure shock. The red line is the government investment shock. And the blue line is the government transfer shock. And what we see immediately here is the dynamic adjustment of the economy to each of these government expenditure shocks are very different. I mean, that's, that's the one key insight we want to point out. Um, and what's clear is that an investment shock, as we see here in the government debt to GDP, actually leads to an initial reduction in the debt to GDP ratio, which actually would dampen the risk premium. So this long rate is not the risk premium, it's the long rate that incorporates the risk premium. And this is actually reducing the pass through of the short term interest rate. And the short term interest rate is the response of monetary policy to that shock. Right? So the short term interest rate is going to respond to some kind of Taylor reaction function, output of inflation. And um, why this is rising is because investment expenditure stimulates output and inflation, a short rate increase uh, response to that. And I'll actually decompose that or, or remove that channel. And you'll see that the endogenous response of monetary policy here is quite important for government investment expenditure. Um, uh, and then just maybe taking a look at uh, government consumption expenditure. These are the two main components I'll focus on. You see that you know, out, the output response is, is, is negligible. Is actually a bit of disinflation. And in response to this, the short-term interest rate drops. Um, but you see that the debt to GDP ratio rises a lot. And this then raises the risk premium, which then, if you see the long rate here, it's close to zero. It, it, it offsets those gains from monetary accommodation, in a sense. And then you see a, a rise in government debt. Uh, the right column here is those combined effects. And what's interesting is that these combined effects, so the net effect, of each of these shocks, if I weight it just by the relative shares of the spending components as a, as a share of the total, um, that this comes out very close to that reduced form measure, right? Just using debt or deficits to try and identify the effect of debt on interest rates. Whereas here, I specifically look at the government spending shock that raises debt and then the response of interest rates to debt. Um, and I'm not going to go into details of the table. Um, can I ask you something? Uh, yes. Sorry. Yes. So can I ask you something? Can I go back to, uh, to understand exactly what, what the structure of the model is? Now, you, uh, the government spending shock is contractionary. Where, where is the contraction? Where is the contractionary effect of the government spending shock coming from? Therefore, what is the response? Because here you don't have an increase in long rate. Short yes. rate go down because inflation go down. Yeah. Output doesn't react. Therefore, what is the up? Where, where is the crowding out coming in? Because yeah, you I'm have no Ricardian or Ricardian. Therefore, I'm going I, to, I, yeah. 
decompose that in a second. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. But are you asking something about the relative shares of Ricardian and non-Ricardian households? No, no. I'm asking uh, uh, why in the model the government spending shock has as a contractionary effect. Where is the contraction coming from? Because it's, it doesn't come from the long rate. Um, yeah, well, this is what I'm going to decompose. I think it does partly okay. come from the long-term, uh, the risk premium rising, which is offsetting the monetary accommodation. Um, and there's also some effect on the degree of crowding out, yes. Um, but the long but rate is, is going down. Therefore, you say it's going down less. Yeah, it's going down and... much less than what the short-term rate, right? So that's times four. That's about 40 basis points at its peak in an annualized rate, in the short rate. So that'll be the response. Now, that's supposed to bring down the long rate as well. But then the risk premium obviously offsets that to a large extent. So government expenditure is raising output directly, but this rise... Um, this rise in the risk premium is not um, uh, stimulating private sector consumption expenditure or investment, um, which would have come by the short rate falling by the monetary policy response. But then what is the determining the risk premium here? Just the amount of debt. Therefore, the amount risk. of debt is directly correlated to the risk premium. Therefore, you have an increase in debt. Risk premium increase. This is contract the economy. Monetary policy react by reducing the interest rate, stabilizing output, and stabilizing the long term. Therefore, uh, counteract the change in the risk premium. Yes. Yes. Perhaps if I may, yeah. Is there another question? I mean, no, no, no. Was there... Okay. Oh, yeah, I, I think just, you've I would got just it try right. to understand it's, what the mechanism is in the model. I, the four is, yeah, so the, the main thing I want to show on this slide is that the expenditure components are different and they really point out between consumption expenditure, investment expenditure, that they're markedly different. And just to highlight some of the, the endogenous response of monetary policy and the risk premium, but I'm going to decompose that in a second. So um, the main thing is, is that interest rates respond differently to these different expenditure components, but on the net, that those values in the first column actually correspond very closely to where if you looked at just a reduced form um, structural model. Um, Colton, uh, yes. Sorry, Colton, I've got a, I've got a question. Um, I haven't seen the, uh, the equations. Um, I just want to, I'm just yes. wondering whether a, um, the link between debts and deficits, how that if uh, and how it's featured in a model. So I'm going, to give you, I'm going to give you a simple example. Suppose we have a fiscal impulse. Um, you know, like, let's say uh, the NHI. So it's a, a certain component of government spending increases. If there's no response of taxes, the deficit increases. That uh, implies an increase in the, in the debt. So the debt level goes up. Uh, then on that debt, I'll be paying interest. So uh, government spending uh, on interest uh, goes up. That basically means that overall government spending goes up. So given no response in taxation, the deficit increases. So I've got this uh, this, this vicious dynamics between. Yeah. Uh, is that does it does it feature somewhere in in the model or? So uh, yeah. So this is we've got the government's um, uh, budget constraint. Right, so you've got the expenditure components, the tax revenue components, and, they, and so that primary balance, which is made up of those components, must equal the, the, the um, well, if it's a de deficit, then you would need to accumulate debt. And the risk premium is incorporated in that, in that um, um, budget constraint. And then you've got the six instruments of fiscal policy that follow these reaction functions with an ARO1 reaction function that also responds endogenously to output and debt. And we estimate all these parameters. Um, okay. but it is important here, and we can get to this again, is that because government debt to GDP is an observable variable in this model, I've got 18 observable variables already, 21 shocks. And, and you, because you've got all the expenditure and t uh, tax revenue um, variables as well observed, that it's, I haven't figured out a way to include the, the observed long rate. And it's not exactly obvious to me that you would want to actually fix it to the 10-year rate, for example. So what I've 
done is I've actually just used the fact that this um, long-term rate is the main component that drives this. And that's from the Federico paper and, and a, a bunch of other papers you know, uh, internationally that aren't related to South Africa, that, that debt GDP ratio is the main component that drives that risk premium. So that's the endogenous component in the risk premium. And then you have those shocks. And maybe if I show you right at the end, we can talk about that. There I plot the implied long rate, which is that solid line there. And then just to get an idea, there's the short-term three-month rate, the long-term 10-year rate. Um, I'm thinking of other ways of thinking about this. I'm, I'm actually want, I'm wondering whether or not there's some, you know, a, this, this implied rate, the spread over the short-term rate is some linear combination of the maturity structure or the, the different rates of return on the maturity structure of, of, of the, the, the government's um, debt, debt profile, right? Or debt composition. That, All right. that is something to talk about and to think about. But for now, this is an implied long rate from the model based on the short-term interest rate and based on the um, endogenous response of debt GDP and as well as an exogenous risk premium component. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I'm sure you've got fiscal rules. Uh, yeah, typically people, fiscal reaction functions. Yeah. I wouldn't call them fiscal people, rules. So people typically have uh, uh, either spending or taxes responding to the level of debt, uh, something like that. Uh, so I'm wondering if you switch off the uh, some of these parameters in these rules. Suppose there's no there's no feedback because we know we need to run surpluses uh, yeah. in in South Africa. That's not going to happen. I mean, it's you know it doesn't look like it's going to happen in the short run. Um, so it appears that in the context of South Africa, we have rising debt levels. We know this. Uh, do we see uh, a negative response of spending to debts? The answer is no. Uh, so I'm wondering what's going to happen in, in the model uh, if, we, uh, if we sort of uh, shut down these rules. Uh, will oh, that, this yeah, that's a great question. Um, actually, that's exactly what Harry does uh, in what Bill in his thesis, which we working on and put it as a working paper. So I'm not, it, it, the, 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 the relative importance of those endogenous responses is in that working paper. Perhaps I shouldn't talk about it here now. It's not fresh in my mind, we, we can look at that and maybe discuss it later. But yes, we do in that paper look at turning off those endogenous responses to look at the debt dynamics. Um, but yeah, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't have implications for, you know, the model not solving. Yeah. So there's not explosive dynamics or anything by switching off that response. What's nice is there in that first slide, right? There's that S-shaped response. So <laughs> apparently in the data, government consumption expenditure does adjust in a sustainable way. The deficit spending and then the primary, the, the primary balance uh, responds by actually turning into surplus. Whether or not that's government spending or other expenditure components that are cut or revenue. Um, and again, this is not positive or negative. Obviously this will be the, the mean which would be a slight primary balance deficit. I, I can't remember what the mean is uh, of, of uh, uh, the, the data. Does that uh, answer the question a little bit? Sure. I mean, you're absolutely right. You're both, yeah. yeah. No, thanks okay. very much. Thanks. Okay, yeah, you, you spot on. It's right, uh, yeah. So, and, and what I want to point out here with the revenue, I, I shouldn't have kept the revenue shortfalls. I, I think that's maybe a, a bit too strict, but I think it is an important aspect to consider because there's strong evidence to suggest that the fiscal projections do fall short of what is realized in the revenue side. And um, what I find is that, again, these are not marginal tax rate changes. So these are the, the realized tax revenue that government receives. So, you know, when there's a, a, um, a tax revenue shock that's negative, so it's a tax cut, revenue cut, that this is actually contractionary because government spending falls in response to that tax revenue cut and then government actually needs to accumulate debt to finance that shortfall. And that's why I, 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 I kind of spoke about it in those terms, but I, I need to be very careful here because you can't map this automatically to marginal tax rate changes. There is some evidence that effective and average tax rates change uh, changes to effective and average tax rate uh, are similar, but there, there's nothing like this I, I've seen in South Africa. So I, I, I kind of steer clear of this. And I think there's reasonable arguments to make to 
I mean, that we know that the, the that we the very likely at the top of the lapper curve, um, there's not much room on the revenue side. I mean, we recently just dropped the corporate uh, income tax by one percent. Um, so, yeah, but I think what's interesting here is that the impulse responses are qualitatively very similar, right? Um, the magnitudes differ, but the, 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 the responses are very similar, and that's in marked contrast to the expenditure side. And Eric actually spoke about this a little bit, you know, yesterday. He mentioned about how the expenditure side, you know, tends to be more, more adjusted more actively. It makes sense. And the revenue side can have, kind of have its, you know, there's tax buoyancy. Um, over the cycle, but those changes at a much lower frequency, whereas at a, uh, for the, the, the expenditure side is, will be at a much higher frequency, and maybe there's something in the in the data there that that's obviously showing that. Um, all right, but let's maybe get into these the, these transmission mechanisms. So here I I first look at the risk premium, and then I'm going to look at the endogenous response of monetary policy, and then the crowding in and out. And I'm only going to focus on the two main expenditure components, uh, investment and consumption. Um, so here, government consumption spending with and without the risk premium. And what we see, I mean, you, you could have observed this from the results, but hopefully, Nicola, this is kind of helping to shed light on your question, that if we switch off the risk premium, endogenous risk premium response to the debt to GDP ratio in that long rate, right? So that's the red line. Um, what do we see? We see a much larger increase in output, right? In response to the government spending shock, it's not that large, 0.1% um, um, deviation from steady state. Um, we see government debt is lower, right? By 0.2 percentage points at its peak. Um, and the contraction uh, in government investment expenditure as well as transfers is, is, is less. And then the debt to GDP doesn't rise as much and then you see that the short rate response compared to the, the very strong uh, uh, accommodative stance when we had the risk premium, that, so in other words, that negative feedback from the government spending that elicits debt financing that then feeds into the risk premium, monetary policy re uh, 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 responding to that because of this effect on, up, on, on inflation in particular by cutting the rate, but that doesn't take place because that negative effect of uh, of debt on the risk premium is much more dampened. Okay, I mean, and so that's I think that's that's quite a nice clear result. For investment expenditure, we see a very uh, minimal role for the risk premium. And this is because government investment expenditure tends to reduce the debt to GDP ratio, um, and and it doesn't have as much a, a larger effect. You know, 0.1, uh, 0.2 uh, uh, percentage points versus you know in, in government consumption consumption expenditure reaching up to 0.65 uh, percentage points okay so a, a, a much more significant influence of the risk premium on consumption expenditure as opposed to investment expenditure yeah i've probably got about seven ten minutes say eh, nicola um i'll be finished um and so looking at monetary policies so what I've got here, you've got the black line, which is the estimated margin. Five minutes, uh, five minutes I give you. Five minutes, There is a lot okay. of questions, there is a lot of questions to answer. Okay, great, so five minutes, you just stop me. Um, but I'm almost done. So now decomposing the role of monetary policy. So what I did here is I looked at kind of like a dovish scenario where, you know, uh, this is, uh, it allows the model to solve, right? Because you've got to have the response to be a little bit larger than one. So I turn off the, res the endogenous response of monetary policy to output and set a uh, response to inflation to 1.1. So this is kind of like a dovish central bank. Um, and then I look at a no response scenario where you know, the interest rate is highly persistent, 0.199, and that's the dashed line. So what do you see here with, in response to government consumption expenditure? You know, um, that if uh, governments, response to the disinflationary effect on, uh, of a government consumption expenditure on inflation, right? That that's progressively gets less. So you go from the solid line in the short rate, slightly less if it's a more dovish central bank, but it still adjusts quite a bit because the disinflation is large. And if we go to the no near invariant response, I would say um, to the short rate, you see that that, um, um, effect on output, it, it gets larger towards the end, but, it, but it's still uh, 
dampened here, right? And it allows for higher, higher government debt. Um, but this is, the effect is much lot more pronounced for investment expenditure, right? So if um, the short rate is allowed to, res uh, to respond in the, in the estimated model, as I described, that's the black line. Maybe let's just look at the no response when the, the short-term rate rises you know, very mutably in, res in response to the output increase. What do we see? Government debt is significantly low um, and the debt to GDP ratio falls by a lot more. So that's that role of the endogenous response of monetary policy to government investment expenditure is clearly um, 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 important and the, the, this channel is clearly important. And the, the kind of substitution effect of government investment that would reduce government consumption expenditure is also much less. So again, the risk premium seems to be really important for government consumption expenditure, whereas the monetary policy channel seems to be more important for government investment expenditure. Maybe the last one, we look at the crowding out. Um, so what I did here is, in fact, in, in this version of the model I'm working on, I, I do actually fix this, the, the parameter, the substitutability parameter one. So essentially it's not a the CES function turns to a Cobb-Douglas aggregator uh, for the consumption inputs of, of, of private and government consumption expenditure. Um, but because I, I, there are reasons why I did this, but in another version, the previous version, we estimated that. And so basically I looked at the range that, were, that, that we've got in those estimates. And they came out about 0.65, which would mean more complementary, and 1.35, which is a very slight substitute. And now you do see in consumption expenditure that it does have, it appear to have an effect, right, on, on the short rate and output and debt. But these are, this is very, these are very small values here. Um, that, that it's changing output in the short rate. So yes, it's there. If we look at the range of, of estimates that, that in the confidence interval that, that, could, that are plausible, <clears throat> um, I don't think it's the main, the main channel that, that's the most significant. And this is even, even less for uh, investment expenditure. Okay, I think I've got one minute, Nicola. Um, yeah. This is the... Um, just to highlight the, the role of monetary policy shocks and the risk premium shocks um, or how interest rates affect that. Um, the main thing here is just that monetary policy shocks and risk premium shocks contribute a large uh, a proportion of the, of the variance of government debt to GDP. Um, and more recently, the, you know, this orange here is, the, is monetary policy and it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's relaxed the, the, the wording here, I've got to be careful. Um, the lower interest rate environment, right, um, has relaxed this, this, the burden of adjustment of government debt. In other words, it's brought down the interest costs um, uh, and which, which allows government, well, it just relaxes that constraint. So it means government need not have accumulated as much debt. But I'm careful to phrase this as monetary policy shocks. And there's a reason for that. And this is in this last set of results um, where I um, look at the, the, the domestic monetary policy shock, the risk premium shock, and the foreign monetary policy shock. I try to in, in, uh, account for cross-correlated shocks. I think there's other ways of the foreign to the domestic spillovers um, because foreign monetary policy shocks are very muted. Um, this is actually, yeah. Uh, then maybe the credit rating. Okay, yeah. shocks we have a more. few questions actually. But yeah, let's let's end. I think everyone yeah. got the main the main gist of the story. That's great. Actually, a few questions on the on this uh, issue. Uh, Ashok, uh, Ashok asked a few questions on this. Uh, on this 30 percent uh, monetary policy expense, 30 percent of the variance uh, of the variance of government debt. Yeah. What do you, what is the correct interpretation? And because what he says is the virus going to, do you mean global monetary policy or domestic or some hybrid? I think the server might be a little uncomfortable that its policy rating explain more than the or the variance of government debt than the risk premium embedded in the long rate. Therefore, okay. Yeah. Jack, what what are these monetary policy shock that explain 30 percent? So I mean. In all standard terms, this is identified monetary policy shocks. I'm just personally uncomfortable with 
claiming that that using a Taylor rule reaction function is going to properly identify domestic shocks because basically what you're saying, especially relative to foreign. So if you look at the, the red here, these are yeah. foreign monetary policy shocks and that's where I've added the spillover effect. Um, and this is something that you find common in open economy new Keynesian models that the foreign yeah. block doesn't yes. have this large effect in the model. And, and I mean, again, it goes to Eric's comments yesterday, you know, much of the models and the development of the literature involve closed economy ma macro models. So these, all, these models are designed to match the moments in a closed economy. So when we, when we extend it to the open economy, it's not that surprising. It's not guaranteed, but it's not that surprising to me that we don't find um, a significant role for foreign shocks. Um, I mean, you, you can build them in. We've done that. I've done that with oil shocks. I mean, they could although, get large. You can build if them. If I can, yes. although you have here something that is, because this, this is the interpretation of the risk premium, yes. The risk premium is reflecting a sort of long-term trend. But a lot of the movement of the risk premium are actually a determination of a foreign shock. And therefore, is the absorption, capacity, yes. the risk absorption yes. capacity, and yes. then is determined very much by US. Therefore, you don't have a direct measurement of foreign monetary policy, but you have a direct me measurement of the effect of foreign, of foreign monetary policy on the risk premium, that is the main channel of the transmission, not only of your debt shock, but also mm. the, of the foreign shock. Yes. For that, uh, you know, in some sense, I, I will see more a risk premium shock as a, monet an, a foreign monetary policy shock. I, 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 I agree with that. And, and to also the reason why I'm, I'm again, I, I'm hesitant to claim that it's domestic monetary policy shocks that are contributing that because it can be used for incorrect inference by saying, okay, monetary policy can hold rates down lower for longer. Sure. And this will now, and now it possibly might, but it's, it's going to, you know, erode credibility. Um, it's not clear yeah. what the effect on inflation will be. Um, so, and then, and to the extent that these shocks are just, you know, the, the, the sob following that of what's happening in the U S um, and Europe and yeah. with interest rates also coming down. So this decline, this, or the whole literature on the decline in long-term yeah. real yields um, or real interest rates and the natural rate, I, it, it's just cautioned me to, to make strong claims about this is a question of uh, Andrea and uh, Eric. Andrea, Andrea. Thanks, Nicola. Um, so Hilton, thank you very much for this, uh, as usual, excellent work. Two questions from me uh, on this particular chart. I'm sort of blown away that markup and demand shocks account for greater variability in debt to GDP than spending and revenue adjustments or spending and revenue shocks. So those are just, netted off. Yeah, so they netted off. I've grouped those. Remember, there's three components in spending and three components in revenue. So they actually are netting off each other. Um, okay. And the risk premium is in the demand shock there. I should okay, still, foreign shock. still uh, if you can, uh, so mm -hmm. just give us a bit of a sense of what exactly are you are you measuring or talking about when you when you speak about markup and demand shock. So just give us the intuition there, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, on your expenditure shocks, and this comes back to the point that Nicola asked earlier. I'm still not clear on how a social transfer shock, positive social transfer shock, is negative for GDP growth, um, considering the impulse responses that you've shown, right? So if, if you could maybe just get back to that at some point yeah. uh, to explain. So, for example, this chart here, your government mm. transfer shock, you can see is positive. Mm. Um, but As it, it's it, causing it, a negative GDP shock. So if that's the case, then then the whole social program, the whole social grant program is an epic failure, right? So, so what are well, you saying? It, 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 it depends on, so yes, there might be a large number of people that receive transfers, but their contribution to the aggregate is very small. 
And this is actually something that you, t that you find in, in, in most of the models that include non-Ricardian and Ricardian households. So when you estimate it, you typically end up with a share of non-Ricardian households of about 0 0.2, 0 0.3. I think in this one, it's about 0.35 estimated, um, very low. And the reason is, is because of their, their relative size in the aggregate. And that's, that, 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 that's why, you, you know, when you, you're not giving every household that transfer, it's, you're giving a, a portion. So that's one, yeah. the effect is not gonna be that large. And then again, um, there, there will be these factors. I didn't look to see the crowding out and the risk premium and the endogenous response and monetary policy to, to um, the transfer shock. I mean, I can look into that, but I mean, I think if just by eyeballing this, it is very clear that the rise in debt and then the rise in the long rate is gonna be um, mm. uh, facilitating this contraction. Okay, so, so basically you're arguing that the recording equivalence principle is going to, you know, more than compensate or more than offset the stimulatory effect of social grants. Mm. Yeah. Eric, yeah. last question. With some error Eric. band around that, that impulse response function. Okay, I would say it's Thank more you. close to zero. Thanks. Oh, but your, your other question about the decomposing the shocks. Yes, yeah, so I mean, there's 18 shocks. If I showed all 18 shocks, it might look more um, like a colorful tropical, you know, coral reef. Um, so it's just a little bit easier to group them. The technology and labor shock are your kind of standard ones. The, the, the markup will be the, the price markup shocks in domestic and, and, and for, uh, imports, uh, imports, not foreign, but imports. Um, and as well as wage markup. Um, so it is, it is you, you can't really make too much inference and I don't really like to make too much inference from the historical decompositions because it's, it's the contribution in that point of time, there's no error bands around this, but it, it does help with the narrative and the story and, and just highlighting that the risk premium effect and the monetary policy effect are quite large. And then at least you get the direction of, of the sign which direction Eric, so the blue uh, is this premium and that's pushing up and the orange is bringing it down and that's my uh, eric uh, eric uh, the last question for you okay i'll be i'll be quick um yeah this problem that these these new open economy new keynesian models um attribute a very very small role to foreign shocks is is pretty well known nobody solved it but it's well known but one thing you might consider doing is putting something like the US interest rate in the monetary policy rule, mm. because then, and you can have that enter as a separate exogenous shock as well, mm. um, but that might suck up some of this orange and push it into foreign. Yeah. Um, the That's second exactly. couple, couple of other quick things that uh, I would encourage you to think about, um, we found that spending reversals were an important feature of the data. And I'm wondering whether one explanation for the difference between government consumption and investment is that in government consumption, you tend to get a spending reversal um, over time, whereas in investment, you don't. And then finally, on the investment part, it, it, does government capital enter production? Yes. And how do you identify the exponent? That's a really critical oh, yeah. parameter, and it's really poorly identified in these models. I, yes, and I do not know what that value is right now. I can quickly go look. That's a great question. Um, yes. So, I mean, I, one of the things, because that's so important, yeah. um, I think it's very, it's critical that you do a fair amount of sensitivity analysis on that. And um, maybe even doing a prior or posterior predictive analysis um, to see what range of results you could get. Yeah, that's important. So I, th uh, I think, um, so there's different capital, thank you very much for those of, I mean, obviously brilliant and, and I look into that. And I, the capital accumulation, there's capital accumulation equations for, for both uh, government and private capital. Um, and obviously investment is the input there. Capital is then aggregated through um, uh, into, the, into the production function. And then there's uh, private sector uses investment um, inputs from government and, and 
the private sector and there's an elasticity of substitution between them as well. Very much like how consumption expenditure will enter into households utility, it's kind of investment is the same and in, in then in in, it gets used in capital and capital then gets used in the production process. But I, I agree, I, 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 think, I think Constantine in the first time I presented this also spoke about this, so thank you. Uh, excellent, thank you, thank you very much.